uh, welcome to this session advanced automated visual regression test by shweta sharma so we are glad that they joined us today uh, we would like to thank browser stack for sponsoring this session so i think without any further delay uh, shweta over to you the stage is to you thank you arvik for that i'm just going to uh, turn off my video because it would interfere with my demo yeah so good morning everyone uh people attending from asia india and uh, good afternoon if you are attending uh, from a slightly different uh, time zone and uh, so today's session is going to be about uh, advanced automated visual regression testing as the title uh, suggests and uh, my name is shweta sharma and i work as the director of qa services at excellent and uh, these are like quick social media details about me if you want to stay connected with me and uh, i would like to uh, please feel free to reach out on any of these okay uh, quickly about excellent uh, firstly is that uh, we are a completely distributed remote working organizations working across six different time zones and uh, we've been in the industry for over 10 years in fact uh, i think we've been like for around 13 years now and uh, it's a small organization in terms of strength yeah like we are like 110 plus enthusiastic um, kind and open professionals i i joined organize i joined excellent like we were just like when 25 of us so yeah we've we've seen growth in terms of uh, strength as well and we've had over 150 plus partner engagements and um, so yeah we are primarily a drupal agency which means you know there's a lot of contribution we do via code uh, to drupal which is open source and uh, till date we've had around 1000 plus open source contributions uh, from excellent this is going to be the agenda and not a uh, read out this is just for the recording and for you to glance through and uh, so this is what i'm going to be talking about for the next uh, 40 minutes roughly or 45 yeah okay so uh, let me just brief you about the concept what what do you what do you mean by testing visual right when you say that you're going to uh, test the visuals probably what you mean is you're going to test the interface the user interface or the graphical user interface right just go on adding prefixes to uh, the interface itself you're going to test um, how a particular interface looks like on several browsers and several mobile devices because you know mobile is the current and the future as well isn't it right so when you add the prefix automated to this kind of testing it means that you're going to automate the verification of the user interface right simple i mean you know that's that's how this term actually is derived so when you say that you're going to check the user interface primarily what do you mean by you know you're going to check the user interface what do you do right as a tester right as or as, as some some other um, person on the team what do you do when you're going to say that you check the user interface you're going to check the visual content right there's so much of content displayed whether there is so much or whether there's little you're going to check the content you're definitely going to check the page layout right what i mean by the layout is broadly the page is divided into say the header the footer the main section right so you're going to check the layout whether when they are bundled together do they appear correctly and we spoke of responsive design right because yes you definitely want to ensure that your application looks visually perfect on um, various resolutions right so that's how the third point comes in okay and before diving into uh, you know how we do it and all it's really important to understand the objective behind this right because it's such a sad state that uh, when people want to jump into automation they are directly focused so much on the tool aspect and the, you know which language should i choose without you know even understanding what's the objective behind it so let's understand why do we need this sort of uh, automated testing in place first right so the first point is the human factor what do i mean by the human factor 
right? First of all, like, you know, there are two limitations that I can see is that I have actually experienced is there are limitations of the human eye itself, right? So if you say, if you say two hex codes, two different hex codes of orange color, right? They are actually two different hex codes, but the human eye might perceive or will perceive it as one orange color. Right. So that's the limitation. And I've worked with clients who are extremely particular about having the exact hex codes in place. Like, you know, the entire family of orange is not the same for them. And of course, there is science of accessibility behind it. And that's the reason why they want it that way. The other limitation is um, whenever humans are involved in repetitive mundane tasks, they are prone to error. I mean, I am sure if you're going to check that user interface for the next six months, you're going to miss out on the most obvious bug also on home page. That's that's a given. That's how we are programmed as humans. The second factor is the larger device OS matrix and which adds to, uh, you know, the larger release cycles. I mean, I want a thumbs up if you test on, uh, say, at least minimum three browsers, right? Minimum three browsers and uh, say, you know, at least on uh, iOS phone, iPad or Android phone and Android tablet, right? That's the requirement. That's the minimal requirement we have at Exilerant, be it any project, right? And to add, we've also had specific requirements when it comes to IE 11, right? Of course, you know, uh, there's a different story that the support might be taken off and, you know, I 11 is going to move to edge completely, but that's a different story, right? So the number of browsers go on adding and just imagine your QA team needs to verify this on Chrome, Firefox, Safari. And then there is, um, then there is this UC browser on mobile, which, yeah, I mean, yeah, I have worked on a client which was so focused on UC browser. So doing it all humanly is it's just going to keep you behind in terms of releases and it's going to keep you out of the market that way. Right. And this is, again, a very important point is that your automated functional suite doesn't really verify the UI. Does it? No, unless you have written assertions to verify the CSS, which is, again, a time consuming task and not as effective as this tool would do it for you, right? We will see an example. And last, like, you know, I think as testers, as human testers, we should be focusing more on what we are doing at best, which is um, verifying the usability and understand how user friendly is the application instead of doing mundane tasks. I'll, I'll reiterate, leave the mundane repetitive tasks to tools and utilize uh, your creativity, your innovation in bringing more value to the application that humans would bring and not the tool really. So let's let's quickly understand as well, how does this uh, basic algorithm work? Um, even if you know many of you all know how it works, I would just like to quickly reiterate. Um, so once once the test runner is initiated, right, what what's going to happen on the first run is your um, your script is going to capture baseline images, right? And it's going to store it. And on subsequent runs, what it does is it's going to capture the screenshot again at runtime and it's going to capture this current screenshot with the one that you stored here as a baseline image and it's going to run a comparison algorithm. And once the comparison is done, you know, there are going to be two outcomes, right? Either the test passes, right? Or it's it's going to report differences. It's not going to fail the test because the tool doesn't really understand whether the test has failed or not. So it's not going to fail the test, but it's going to report differences, right? And what, what happens when it has reported differences? There, there are just going to be two possible outcomes here. One is that... It's um, it's unintended, unintended, right? So which means that the differences were reported and uh, you do not really expect those differences, which means it's a bug. The tool is highlighting the difference and it's a bug. But if it's intended, if you like, you know, if you were expecting that difference, it's because your baseline image uh, needs to be updated, right? Say, I'll give you an example. Say, for example, your baseline image had um, a screenshot here of the header which uh, did not have the add to cart icon. But after the feature was developed, you know, the add to cart icon needs to be updated as per this 
step. And that's the reason the screen reported the, the tool reported the differences. So let's take a quick look um, at the demo using Backstop JS. So I'm going to give a demo of this basic concept using Backstop JS. Uh, I would expect or I would request the attendees to go full screen so that this is uh, properly visible to you. It's a recording. Oops. Just give me one second. Yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to run the command backstop reference and it's going to this command is going to capture all the baseline shots, like which is the second step, right? So it's saying, see, creating new reference file. And uh, once the references are created, uh, it would store those images here. And since I had configured Backstop JS to capture screenshot on three different um, viewports, which is desktop, phone, and tablet, it has done that accordingly. Yeah. So, so this was the site uh, or this was the website that I've used for demo, which is Urban Hipster, which is uh, built using Drupal Commerce. And if you see, we, I have captured here uh, the screenshot for category listing page for women. And uh, it has captured the screenshot correctly for desktop. This is for phone. It's captured the full page uh, screenshot. And what we're going to do is we are going to rerun this test, uh, assuming that, you know, there were some changes or, you know, there was some development or, or, you know, there was some parallel development that was happening. And we are just going to check the regression by using the command backstop test. Oh, so fantastic. You know, all three tests have passed and nothing broke. And if you see, uh, the reference image is on the left and the recent image that got captured on the actual run is under the test column. And you can see that it looks fine for all three viewports. Yeah, so there were no differences reported, right? So... Okay, just give me one sec. Yeah, but then, you know, things are not really uh, as rosy uh, as they appear to be in demos, in presentations, right? There are ch challenges with this, this sort of automated testing as well, as you would face challenges with any other uh, automated testing types. Yeah, I mean, there are challenges and we we all we want to do is look for uh, potential solutions. So I will address a uh, primary challenges over here of automated visual testing is anti aliasing. So what is really anti aliasing, right? So anti aliasing, I would I would in layman terms, what I would say is that, you know, every machine has a different hardware configuration and there are different softwares associated with those hardware and probably say a picture captured on a Mac would be different than a picture captured on a Windows machine. And if you're going to have a comparison between those two images, oh my God, this tool is going to scream like every time you run that comparison. So that's that's one of the primary challenges. The second challenge is interesting, dynamic content, right? Now, um, go to if you go to say Yahoo homepage, right? Or if you go to Yahoo News, you would see that um, the layout might be similar every day, right? But the news is definitely going to change, right? And there would be even cases that the new change, the news changes twice or thrice a day. So which means that your tool, every time the content, the text changes on that application, the, screw, the tool is just going to scream out with, you know, oh my God, there are so many differences. And there are other also dynamic content, like even if you have a, comparatively um, decently 
uh, I would say, you know, static page, you would see that you would have different ad blocks or, you know, there is a slideshow which is running, which would have different content displayed. And how would you deal with such uh, such challenges, right? Because every time there's a difference, the tool is going to scream. So we want to uh, look for solutions which is going to deal with this. And these are inevitable. You cannot just expect a site to be static. Okay, so talking about the first primary challenge uh, was anti-aliasing. These are the few solutions uh, that I have tried, that we try at Accelerant uh, for anti-aliasing is that uh, use a Docker setup. Uh, if you are not aware of it, what I would say is that, you know, it would give you a uniform environment every time. So which means, you know, if your Docker engine is um, or if your Docker setup has, say, you know, a Linux box, and um, if you if you plan to run those tests, say probably on a Chrome browser within that box, then uh, at least when other team members are going to run those tests, uh, we are not the the probability of running into false positives is going to decrease because of that. Uh, another solution, of course, this doesn't come free uh, because uh, uh, because you know cloud is not free really. The service is not free. Right. So you can what you can do is you can uh, run your uh, tests on browser stack source labs. What I mean by that is you can run on uh, the environment that is provided by these. So like, you know, there is a set of we all know there's a set of browsers, devices with the OS combination provided by these uh, devices, these tools. So, again, you know, that solves the problem of anti-aliasing if you if your team is on different machines, different browsers. And so so, you know, just go on cloud. And the third option again is, or go for a tool which handles it implicitly, right? There, there is a tool which handles anti-aliasing. Okay, and now, so I've been talking about uh, dynamic content challenge, right? So I would also like to demo this challenge, right? So that you all relate it more to it. Let me just go full screen. So I'm running the test again, the previous test only. Uh, it's just running on the home page now, which has a slideshow really. Right, okay. It's gonna fail for sure, yeah. You see, so three failed, okay. Which means uh, the home page test for desktop, uh, phone and tablet, all three have failed. And you can see the differences highlighted here in pink, this section. Right. So we can we can clearly see that uh, the slideshow is the reason why this particular test has failed. Right. So this is the scrubber is one of the features provided by Backstop JS. Right. And you can see. So the reference image here was created using uh, exclusive styles, new arrivals. Whereas during test, what it did was it actually captured screenshot from the first image of the slideshow and that's the reason you know this tool is screaming that okay there's difference by the way i forgot to tell backstop js is a free tool to use so you know you should give it a try i will also give the references here okay i'll have to present again Yeah, you, you saw, you know, how uh, dynamic content really uh, is a challenge. So what what are the solutions for dynamic content, right? So there are primarily these two strategies, which is called hide and remove, right? So what, what the hide strategy is going to do is it's going to hide all elements queried by, so uh, either WebDriver IO or back, Backstop JS, you know, both these tools actually, they, they, they utilize the same strategy. Right. So we're going to we're going to see how the strategy can be actually implemented. What hide does is it's it's going to. So what we've used for the slideshow is we are going to hide that slideshow. What it's going to do is it's going to fill that element space with a solid space. Right. And what the remove strategy is going to do is it's going to remove uh, the elements that we have uh, captured in our configuration files. Now, to help 
you understand better what could be the good candidates for hide the ad blocks the images that change right and remove could be uh, sticky headers and footers pop over help chats that that uh, windows that appear on your application you don't you don't really need that when you want to capture the screenshot right so you can use the remove strategy there and let's see that strategy in action really okay right so if you see here um what i've done is i have actually hidden the home page carousel slide right i have put that css selector um uh, in the hide selectors uh, it, this is an array so obviously you can hide multiple such elements and there is this also beacon marker right which i haven't showed you or probably i can show it to you later right there is there is also this flickering beacon marker on the website right which i don't really want to be captured during my screenshots because it's just interfering with this right so this is a screenshot from backstop js right and um, yeah so what i did was i captured a new reference image after i introduced that strategy and you see that how this slide show is actually filled up by a solid space right so the next time the screenshot is going to be uh, run against this new reference image right and it's not even interfering with the page layout it's not that i have removed this slide show completely no otherwise it would interfere with the page layout so that's not a good thing to do in in uh, this case right but there were these flickering star beacons that were running here which i'll show you later right and i've removed those because they are not they are not really adding any value right so let's quickly look into the demo now right you see all three have passed right because you see the reference image is also uh, one which doesn't have dynamic content we've handled that and uh, hence the test has passed so this is how the reference image looked and then the test image also right clear so this is how you can this is like one of the ways to handle dynamic content okay coming to the testing strategy uh, again capturing screenshots can be done at uh, three different levels one is at element level uh, second is full page screenshots and then it can be also done for the current viewport right but when would you want to do this really right so if you if you talk about element level uh, comparison right i wouldn't i wouldn't really recommend it unless you know the development is in progress right again there the grouping of the components has to be done logically right so for example you can have the you can have the comparison run at header you can have the comparison run at footer it has to be logical just don't you know grab uh, say a particular element some sort of a drop down or a checkbox as an element to be captured right so development in progress yes element level strategy is good if you are using any component based libraries like storybook or pattern lab then element level makes a lot of sense of course there are tools which will help you extract um, stories from storybook and uh, you know i mean i could do a different talk really on um, uh, uh, testing strategy using uh, storybook at, right so but just to brief you yes you should use uh, that when you are using component based libraries full page yeah so when would you go with full page is like for example if you want to um, compare to a uh, similar environments right what i mean by similar environments is you have a website running in production and you have a state site which is a replica of your production environment and you have pushed your recent changes and before you know you uh, push it to production you want to ensure that things are looking fine on the ui on stage right uh, and you can compare after you've pushed and uh, that would give you exactly the result that you're looking for and once an entire page is developed since we work a lot on constructing pages and websites using drupal right we know how the development happens there it happens in increments right i'm not going to have the entire home page ready in one sprint right so once the entire page is developed go ahead and change your 
automated visual tests, yes test maintenance applicable here as well, and uh, change the screenshot uh, strategy for uh, to capture the entire page. Okay, and plan the level of visual coverage that is needed really, right? So even for your browsers and devices, every project is different because our customers are different, right? Because I have worked with customers in the Middle East, right? They have a different uh, browser and uh, device matrix entirely, trust me, right? And there is absolutely no point in uh, providing coverage for uh, browsers that's not needed there. No, just, just remove that. So you have to plan that beforehand. Identify patterns from your previously learned uh, lessons. What I mean by that is that um, if you have observed certain type of pages break on certain types of browsers or devices, you know, I would say that uh, capture that in your lessons learned, create your documentation and ensure that uh, those kind of pages are certainly checked on those browsers and devices. You do not miss out on that, right? And application wide, don't capture all pages. I, recently, you know, we got we got a project wherein there are hundreds of pages, like, and you know, it's the legacy application is developed using ABC technology, and that that they want it to be developed in Drupal eight right now. You think we are going to capture pages for all hundreds of uh, pages? No, definitely not. We're going to choose appropriate samples. What I mean by samples is we have different categories of pages. Like we have a landing page, we have a listing page and within landing page, you know, we have different combinations uh, where they want um, the page to look this way. But of course, we are going to choose appropriate samples and capture screenshot. We are not going to capture screenshot for hundreds of pages for sure. Right. Good practices to follow. Um, OK, wait. Oh, I, yeah. Sorry. I think the first point is repeated. Let's move on to the second point, which is organizing the test suites. As I mentioned, you know, take your lessons learned, right? So uh, it's not compulsory to execute everything on all browsers, right? I will show you how I have um, actually categorized a feature or tests as per browsers as well, right? So you can have certain tests running only on Firefox, only on i11. If you feel that there is a certain uh, uh, set of important test cases or probably you can have a smoke suite ready for your automated visual tests as well, you can have that smoke suite executed on all the browsers and devices, but then you can have the others, you know, uh, just that's, that, that's just talking about, you know, reducing your execution time. And certainly, you know, we're going to, we're going to also be talking about few commercial tools or not completely free tools. And they charge you on screenshots, right? So you have to wisely use your plan there. And that's the reason we need this kind of um, strategy in place, right? Um, identify the frequency to run your visual tests. Do you want to run it with every build really? No, because in one of our projects, you know, what I ask them to do is run it after every deployment. That's enough because that's the strategy we need there. We don't want to run it on every commit really. That's that's not that kind of project. So it's not needed, right? You're going to save on execution time. You're going to save, forget execution time. You're going to save on your plan. If you are an organization that is newly looking for uh, adopting these tools, you would have to think about that, right? Yeah, so this is a, a practical example of how you can organize tests as per the browser, right? So if you see, if you see in this panel, what I've said is that uh, run the blog listing test only on Firefox, right? And run the contact us form only on IE 11 because we found out that, you know, forms were breaking on IE. So I just said, okay, that go ahead and run the contact test only on IE. And similarly, these are our common tests. So, there, so you know, there is this uh, blog, blog node page, like, you know, the blog page, main page, which is an important test for me. And that's the reason, you know, I'm going to have it run it on all browsers and devices. And talking about running them on cloud. So this is the configuration from WebDriver IO, right? So you can specify uh, browser stack capabilities here over here clubbed with Selenium. You can uh, specify um, the browser, the OS, the exact version, the build name, project name. And you can also uh, mention which test should run on this particular uh, combination and which test should run on this particular uh, combination. 
yeah now creating sweets is another good practice that i would suggest is uh, because you know when you would want to have your test running as part of the ci pipeline you would want only the smoke uh, test to run as part of the build right if that's the strategy you are planning to adopt in order to uh, reduce the build time so start creating your sweets well before time right so like you know when once you have uh, a lot of tests in place uh, this might be time consuming so let's look for a proactive approach than a reactive approach start and um, again you know uh, divide sweets as per your feature so say tomorrow if there are changes only to the block feature right i i wouldn't be interested in running all the tests right smartly what i would do is probably i would just run all the tests that are related to the block suite right to have quick and immediate feedback so divide your um, automated tests also into suites okay and how we integrated really in our development workflow at excellent so this is how the ci cd pipeline looks like at excellent what we follow is that you know once the code is committed uh, we have a db docker running so the advantage of db docker really is that we don't have to worry about the data creating the test automation data every time we have um, we have the data seeded quickly uh, into the database and then our acceptance and visual regression tests are running in no time because the scripts primarily focus on um, uh having more valuable tests and assertions in place really rather than worrying about you know uh, the test automation data and further uh once that's one those uh, tests are run it's deployed to uh, several servers okay now let's talk about uh, some practical things in as you know when you want to introduce uh, automated visual tests as part of the ci pipeline right one big challenge would be storing and maintaining images right so just imagine a scenario that two developers um they are working on their feature on their ui feature how do you really expect each one of them to um capture a screenshot store and uh, uh, store the image in the ci where is it exactly going to be stored is it are you going to store it in your repository and what about the maintenance part yeah these are actual challenges in the ci right and identifying the comparison environment right so i mean the first time the developer is going to push uh, her code and uh, what is she going to be really doing yeah i mean the baseline is created and when next time she pushes it again is uh, is i mean against what is the comparison going to run because she is going to be on her feature branch isn't it so what is it the comparison going to run against is it is it going to run on the same feature branch and after she has pushed to the master branch what happens after that right so these are few things that you'll have to think about when you are in the uh, ci uh resolution right so what at excellent we've done is we've used tools uh, like percy right primarily percy is our tool for the ci pipeline and uh, apply tools uh, we use the free version really available from apply tools for smaller projects because uh, we personally we all like the tool it it has a lot of advantages over other tools but uh, when you talk about uh, ci percy is an affordable tool really it takes care of storing the images right and it has an inbuilt logic already in place for a uh, comparison in ci and uh, so this is the actual implementation from our uh, one of our uh, i would say in house projects uh, what we did was uh, last year we uh, migrated uh, our excellent website to drupal 8 and that's when we had uh, visual tests also implemented for this particular project so here if you see on the left you see that this is uh, there's nothing it says it's a new snapshot because we've uh, captured the screenshot for the first time and that's the reason this is the new uh, new screenshot and what happens is when you rerun it's it says that there are no visual changes fantastic right and uh, if you see that these are changes from develop so we have set uh the logic to run these visual tests on develop branch right and uh, our pipeline consisted of uh, checking uh, checking few code quality checks like you know we had the drupal code quality check we had the front end code quality and then we had our uh, visual tests using percy here uh this is uh, the implementation from gitlab 
Right. Now, there was one difference that was reported by the tool. If you see the footer here down below, it it, you know, just screamed in orange saying that, you know, there's something wrong with uh, this. And if you see it, uh, one of our uh, testers, you know, they collaborated and said that it's a padding issue. If you see a comment here, right. But the tool, tool did scream that there was a difference found immediately. Like, and what was the difference? You can see here that this padding issue right below careers that that was missing. So that that was the issue. And we've also integrated it with Slack. You'll have to do this because, you know, if you're looking for uh, beyond local uh, visual validation, uh, if you want uh, the feedback to be reached to the entire team, you should have your uh, collaborative tools integrated with visual testing tools as well. And since Percy provided that, uh, we just leveraged it and um, yeah, so what were the key results really achieved? Uh, one was test data, as I mentioned, since we use DP Docker, we didn't really have to work on um, handling the data or even we did not run into an issue of dynamic content, really, because since the database was uh, consistent every time, uh, we did not run into the dynamic content scenario at all. Uh, the, 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 tool stack, uh, the tool stack that we have used is actually seamlessly integrated with each other. So if you talk about, um, uh, say, we use Cypress, we use WebDriver IO. So if you talk about uh, integration of tools with, say, Apply Tools and Percy with Cypress, WebDriver IO, it's seamless. It's out of the box. You know, all you have to do is just, you know, use their libraries, APIs and connect them. Yeah, it's not it's not difficult. Um, yeah, visual tests that were validated uh, for the site uh, were the replica of the wireframe. Since we had populated the database as close to the wireframe, you know, we tested our uh, visual tests uh, very close to the wireframe. We had populated the database that way. Less number of assertions required for acceptance test automation, right? And I'll show you how. So if you look at this example, this is an example to test the contact us form on uh, the uh, the Drupal Commerce website that we saw. If you closely observe this particular test, there isn't a single functional assertion written here, right? All you can see is that there is only one visual assertion, which is at line number 19, which is going to check the entire page and, you know, uh, it's going to validate the functionality also. The header, the footer, and after submitting the contact us form, you know, whether the uh, the response message is correct, there isn't a single function assur functional assertion here. Whether I have to validate the header is um, visible, the footer is visible, whether the response message is visible, the, there is a map also associated on this uh, page. I haven't written a single functional assertion here. So that's the power of uh, having automated visual tests. What's the biggest limitation so far, really? So the biggest limitation here is that uh, we've spoken of Backstrop JS, we've spoken of Percy, we've spoken of, uh, we haven't really spoken of, but then there are visual regression services available with WebDriver IO as well. All these tools, they do pixel to pixel communication, which means that. Uh, you run into the risk and probability of false positives, right? And that's the biggest limitation because all these tools, they really work on a factor called as fuzz factor, right? So, and you have to specify a mismatch tolerance, right? So the lesser the mismatch tolerance, you know, the more robust are your, I wouldn't say robust, but yeah, you'll, you'll have a better feedback on the test. But, you know, in order to handle the pixel uh, factor, if you go on increasing the mismatch tolerance, uh, that's going to uh, be a pain. You might miss out on actual issues here. And let me show you where the mismatch tolerance is really. Uh, yeah, if you see here. Uh, yeah, so this is the mismatch uh, threshold that is that I've mentioned is 0 0.1, right? So if you run into pixel issues and if you raise this 0 0.1 to save in 0.8, then you might miss out on actual issues as well. And, and hence we reach to Apply Tools. You know why we need to come to Apply Tools is because of this biggest limitation, which is pixel to pixel comparison, which Apply Tools doesn't do. I'm not going to run through all these points because uh, this is for you to just quickly take a look even after the session is over, right? So uh, broadly, Apply Tools does uh, provide a, I would say AI based uh, comparison in place. So there is, and that's why that's the reason you know. Uh, we are not going to run into false positives because they do not do pixel to pixel comparison at all. 
And talking about um, match levels in Apply Tools is that um, if you if you have depending on your website, right? You can you can uh, choose the match level. Forget about the website. Even within certain parts of the website, you can start. Uh, you can switch to different match levels. So when when do you really uh, have a strict match level, right? When you are you when you are want, when you want to compare the content. Right, and that's when, and uh, that when, that's when it would be recommended. Uh, uh, so, sorry, okay, the strict is the default, right? And uh, and uh, it's gonna it's gonna compare the content, uh, and we're gonna have font, we're gonna have layout, we've gonna have we've gonna have color and position of elements in place. Then there is a uh, there is a content match level as well, which is similar to strict, right? But the only difference is it's going to compare content, but it's going to ignore colors. So, for example, if you have a website wherein everything is same, right, but it's just going to have different color, then you can use the content match level there. Then there is this layout match level, uh, which is perfectly applicable in terms of Google News, right? Uh, sorry, uh, Yahoo News that I just said wherein the news changes every day, but probably the layout might be the same. So they have these match levels in place and you can use them. Okay, talking about when to use what, right? So if you have static content, use really any of these tools that I've just mentioned, right? Uh, they would be able to handle it. If you are going to have dynamic content, a lot of dynamic content, you can use these tools, uh, which is uh, Visual Regression Service by WebDriver.io. Then there's Shuv, then there's Backstrap JS. We just saw how they handle back uh, uh, dynamic content. There's shifting content as well. What I mean by shifting content is, say, probably if you want to use, uh, if you want to check a portal wherein uh, the username is going to be different based on the login, then I would say, you know, just go ahead with uh, Apply Tools. Now, uh, quickly, some facts. Uh, there are efforts needed to maintain baseline images, even if you are using tools which have which provide. Uh, the feature or the provision to store images, you would have to maintain baseline images as and how your application changes. Respect the test pyramid. You need to have unit tests. You need to have service level tests, acceptance tests. And then at the top level, I would say would fall visual tests. Visual test is not a silver bullet. You need to have these tests in place as well. It's not a substitute for this. It's just going to complement it. Uh, these are the few best practices that we have uh, looked at uh, before as well that avoid um, uh, avoid too many element level uh, tests because, you know, you would have to maintain the element locators, ensure full page validation, choose the right candidates for automation and do not expect overnight success with this. Yeah, I mean, I think I've been trying this for five years and, you know, since two years we've had it in the CI pipeline. So, yeah, do not expect overnight success if you've. If you if you if, if I've painted a rosy picture from this session, that's not true. But uh, but then where do you go from here? Right. So if you do not have coding knowledge at all, what I would say is use configuration based tools like Backstrap JS, Wraith. Right? You need not write a single line of code. You just need to configure the JSON file and uh, with browser URLs and then you would be able to run and have your. Uh, hello, Shweta. So there is last three minutes going. So yes, you can just run to a couple of sites. Right, right. And this is, in fact, the second last slide. Right. And uh, uh, pair up with developers, right? If you do not have coding knowledge, uh, pair up with developers and uh, have the structure ready uh, using any code based tool, right? So if your developers or probably your SDETs are capable of capable of writing code, which they are, pair up with them and help them understand, you know, what what are the right test cases to be uh, added to this automated uh, visual suite? If you are good with coding, right? If you fall into the second category, look for harmonious integration with your functional suite. What I mean by that is if you, if you already have a functional suite in place, um, help the team by identifying the right tool, the visual tool. Reduce the unnecessary functional assertions. If you already have a functional suite in place, I would say go ahead and start refactoring your uh, suite because if you're adding visual uh, tests, then just delete those unwanted, unnecessary uh, functional assertions uh, to speed up execution. And of course, be brave and bring the tests in your CI pipeline. That's where your technical knowledge is really going to be challenged and helpful. Yeah, let the whole team benefit out of this uh, strategy. These are a few references which you can refer later. 
and uh, yeah thank you so let's i'm ready to take questions thanks a lot uh, shweta i think we we have just a minute left we can take a couple of two questions sure, yes. so there is one mostly like question is like can we integrate backstop js with selenium framework this question is by abhishek gupta <sighs> okay so why do you want to like integrate it with uh, selenium you mean with your functional suite in selenium okay i would say that there are better tools in place backstop js is not really a tool uh, which can be integrated so seamlessly with other uh, other tools that are there if you are looking for uh, bet if you are looking for seamless integration then i would say do not go with backstop js first of all it's it's um it's a config based tool right you can it's not that you cannot but then selenium has nothing really to do with uh, backstop js it's it's a different total uh, it's a totally different setup and um, you can but selenium has nothing to do with backstop js you can you can just go ahead and integrate it so what is a good practice number for setting the mismatch tolerance that's a good question you'll have to identify that for your project right uh i have seen cases where uh, mismatch tolerance of 0.8 has worked good for us right and uh, but that is if you are doing locally right now if you are if you are going to move to more sophisticated tools like percy right uh, there you cannot really control a lot right it's going uh, it's uh, the 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 primary logic or the primary algorithm within the tool is going to identify you for that identify that for you but if you talk about backstop js or web driver io visual regression service uh, you will have to figure that out based on uh, by you know trying out multiple runs 0.5 has worked for us 0.8 has worked for us don't go beyond one you are going to miss out on actual issues that's my experience don't go beyond one <laughs>